Okay, so I'd like to share with you three ideas I've been thinking a lot about recently, about curiosity, about food, and about deserts. No, no, not desserts, which would make sense with food, but deserts. I'm curious, like all of us here in this room and watching the live stream, curious about a lot of things, and I've done a lot of random things to, to, to um, satisfy my curiosity. I've read books, I've written a few books, I've traveled a lot of places. Um, I ran a pig farm for 10 years. It takes a lot to satisfy me. But uh, um, in 2003, I decided to go back to school in my mid-50s uh, to get a degree in history. And it turned out to be food history, one of the things that I am really curious about. At the same time, I took up running. And during one of my study breaks, I was surfing the internet, and up came this beautiful, beautiful view. I was looking for a, a running event. And on the screen came these views of deserts. And uh, it was in Boston, in the middle of the winter. Deserts were appealing at that time. But they were overwhelmingly beautiful. Now, I'd done a few, you know, 6Ks, maybe a 10K, no, 5K, maybe a 10K. And uh, so this was an overwhelming image for a race called the Four Deserts. It was a series of races. Uh, stage races, so that it included the windiest desert, which is in the Gobi, the driest desert, which was in Atacama, which, by the way, I didn't even know where that was, and the hottest desert, which is the Sahara, and the coldest desert, which is the Antarctica. And each of these desert races are about 150 miles long. They take six days. Uh, each day is about 30 miles long. There's one overnight stage that's 50. And you have to carry everything, all your food, on your back. They, the race organizers give you just a tent at night and water. So you have to carry effectively six days of food. And if you don't have enough, you're out of the race. So I was just so curious at the time <laughs> about not only what it would be like to run through that landscape, but whether or not I could finish something like that. So in that moment of curiosity, I registered. <laughs> 2005, I registered, and the race was the Gobi race, was the first one, and that would be in 2006. And I uh, trained, however you do that in the winter for a desert in Boston, run on the beach, and I entered, and I ran. And I have to tell you, that it was hard, okay? This does not mean that I am fearless, right? I'm curious. <laughs> and this was, it just stretched everything that I had in order to do it. And uh, in fact, just before the race, I met a young woman down in the lobby. She was very experienced in doing this, and she said, oh, Robin, by the way, during the race, every fear you possibly can have will come up for you, including all of your character flaws. <laughs> it's great. Great, can't wait. So I went through, and I was afraid of a lot of things. I was afraid of getting lost, I was afraid of running out of food, I was afraid of running out of water, I was afraid of getting lost, I was afraid of, I was afraid of getting lost. You know how afraid of getting lost I was? You know, being at the end of the pack, they wouldn't discover you for weeks. So amazingly, a miracle happened and I finished. It was tough, I finished. I went to the airport on my way home, opened up my laptop, and I looked at 50 mistakes. I typed down 50 mistakes I made. They were stupid. I took bagels. <laughs> bagels. They have almost no nutritional value. They're fat and they're big. They get hard after a couple days. And then I looked at them and I said, became curious. And I said, if I fixed half of these things on the list, wouldn't the next desert be easier? <laughs> Click. Next race. <laughs> All right. I'm in. Sahara race, Atacama race. Antarctica, I finished in 2010. And it was simply by that one moment of curiosity. And I was able to see these possibilities, these possibilities I never thought I would be able to experience by simply having that moment of curiosity. It's the kind of curiosity that enables us to see the world in new ways and anticipate new possibilities. So let me just share with you some of those views that came from that experience.
Sahara, at night on the Atacama, and the Antarctic. So there are also unanticipated possibilities that happen. One of them was my son joined me on the Atacama. And let me tell you, there is nothing like a long walk with your son overnight on a desert when you've talked about everything possible, when the night is full of shooting stars tumbling out of the sky. So unanticipated, these are the surprises, and these are the wonderful things that come from taking just that moment of, of risk and curiosity and allowing it to suspend your rational mind so that the edges of your fear are dulled and you take a, 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 some action. So what does this have to do with food, right? So this is the kind of food you eat on the desert. Yeah, it's disgusting. It's gels, it's powders, it's, it's more energy bars than you've ever, ever wanted to, to eat. But that's not the food I want to talk to you about today. We're afraid of food. So many of us are talking about food right now. We're afraid of having too much food, obesity, not enough food, famine, and the wrong kind of food, the kind that will kill you or make, will be unhealthy. Someone asked me recently about why I was so interested in food. After all, I'm curious about a lot of things. Why food, right? As a food historian, I'm curious about the connection between what we already know about food and what we don't know about food in the future. One way to get a sense of what it takes to really feed the world and the miracle that we get fed at all, right, is to look at something simple to get, to get big first. So I want to have us look at something really simple, and that is to look at something as simple as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, I love these sandwiches. They are the iconic, simple, wonderful, portable sandwich. Apologies to Elizabeth Ando. <laughs> there are no greens and colors, but it is awesome. It is wonderful. So this looks like a very simple, simple thing to have to eat. And I ate it during a snack recently. As I was looking at it, I thought, oh my gosh, this represents how complicated the food system is. So let's take a look at the sandwich. All right, so this is my sandwich, okay? This is the sandwich I had on that day, in that place, at that time, under that, with that, that temperature. So you realize it's a really unique sandwich we're looking at here. So look at this sandwich. I mean, it's, it's got bread, which has been toasted by a toaster. Look what it took to pull this sandwich together, all right? It, it, the bread had to come in a bag, the plastic had to be manufactured, the ink had to be made to print the label, you have to have a jar for the jelly, look at all the components of the jelly, and look at all the different places it came from to go to Texas, and the peanut butter, and the bread, I mean, all the components to bread. How about the baking pans? How about the, in, the knowledge of the person to even know how to bake the bread to do this, and all the transportation infrastructure? And all of this had to come together for this one sandwich. It's a freaking miracle! <laughs> Don't you think? I mean, it is amazing. And you know, with all of this complexity here, isn't it amazing there's not a failure in this, this system here and that someone says, I'm sorry, we don't have that sandwich for you today? How many times that happened? Not that many times. So this miracle, this miracle I call the miracle of feeding cities, takes your breath away when you really think about it. And it's both humbling and challenging to our curiosity, right? Overcoming our fears requires us to bring together all the opposing conversations about food. Food is the grand connector, basically. It's a social network that connects all of us in all places, in spite of our politics, what party we belong to, where we live, what our culture is, we all have this together. You see, our conversations about food, you know, we're a lot of us are talking about food, right? But our conversations, I think, are too small. 
I think, in fact, they're really, really small compared to this complexity. So what happens is we, we think about the problem of obesity, we think about, about growing local, we think about genetically modified seeds, and these are all important and worthy things to think about. But the danger is that we move ourselves into these camps around these issues and therefore limit ourselves from thinking big enough. We need to think big enough to make an impactful improvement to our food system. I mean, really, what do we have to lose? After all, the prognosis for the food of our future is pretty bleak, isn't it? So we have to have an opportunity to use our curiosity. If we don't take this opportunity, we run the risk of wasting time, missing opportunities to leverage our existing resources. I mean, imagine the problems that occurred during Hurricane Sandy when New York City couldn't get water. What will that be like in 2050 when we have nine billion people and something happens? A disruption like that. So in this situation, curiosity is our magic weapon. So at the University of Texas, where I am right now, we're using our curiosity with a new project called the Food Lab. And we are an intensely curious bunch. We've decided that we're going to focus our attention on this sandwich to start with. And we want to create a digital open source map of how Austin gets its food at a very granular level, right down to the salt. We want to create this so we can share this across with other cities eventually. And we feel that this is really a beginning of what we're doing here with the students up there at the food lab. To expand the conversation so that it gets really, really big. Now, this may come as a surprise to you, but we're not the first ones to think about feeding cities. So I'm a food historian, right? So my favorite guy is George Dodd. He was a very inquisitive writer during the Victorian period, and you know the population of London was going from one million to three million during his lifetime in the middle of the 19th century. And so he was a surveyor, and he wrote a book called The Food of London. In the first part of the book, he says, who feeds London? And he answers his own question by saying, no single entity feeds London. Everybody feeds London. And so during that period of time, in fact, thousands and thousands of individuals did feed London as part of the empire and outside of London, inside London. Thousands of individuals around the world had a hand in feeding London at that time. And so it is with us. All of us have a hand in our food system. The act of eating makes you part of the food system. And so today, we can begin to be intensely, fearlessly curious about our food. I mean, the next meal you have, you should first stand in awe. And then I want you to interrogate it. <laughs> and find out everything you can about what you're eating. I mean, what's stopping us? Aren't you curious? Thank you.